We have a lot. Wow, we have a lot of volume. <laughs> we have a lot to be thankful for, don't we? We have a lot to sing and be happy about. Uh, I've heard a couple times and I've prayed all myself. God, thank you for this cool morning. Because Friday's coming. They say it's supposed to be over 100 degrees on Friday. So we thank God for the coolness while we have it. July is just about here. But we have so much to be thankful for. We, there are people who are doing things. Rich was just mentioning all the people that helped out here in the back yesterday to get that ready. You see all the construction that's happening out there. It's looking nice. It's coming together. And we're pres trusting that God is going to do great things. Let that be a great tool. But he's going to do great things among us. He has called us as his people. He has made his spirit to live in us. And he says he desires to do great things through his people to the glory of his name. And we get to be the recipients of that name. We get to wear the name of God Almighty. Can you believe that? We have a lot to give thanks for, a lot to be grateful for. We have a lot to sing and be happy about. There was a meeting several years ago of all the men who walked on the moon. And as the course, as the evening was going along, somebody asked one of the astronauts, they said, when you were standing on the moon and you looked up and you saw that big blue planet hanging off there in space and you realized that that's where your home was, that's where you lived, that's where everybody you know and everybody you love, that's where they were, what went through your mind? The astronaut said, the only thing I could think of at that moment was that my spaceship had been built by the lowest bidder. <laughs> Have you ever felt that way? I've got a great task to do, but I'm not sure I've got the tools to get it done. Man, to take off to the moon takes a lot of faith, doesn't it? A lot of trust in those guys who said they could build a spaceship that would get you there and back. And we've seen things happen in the space program. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a hundred percent. There's a chance there that you won't make it back. It's a hostile environment that we sent those men up in. And to think that they put their trust and those guys who twisted those bolts, who sealed those seams, who made those rockets to get them there and back. And I understand that there is more technology in my watch than there is in the spacecraft that went to the moon and back. They had to surrender themselves to trust somebody else. There are a lot of times we have to trust people in this world. We have to, every time we get on the freeway, <laughs> We have to trust all the other drivers on the freeway that they're going to do what they're supposed to do. And do they? Not always, do they? We have to trust, if we're riding in a car, we have to trust the person behind the wheel, right? Anybody have a trouble with that? Yeah, so I, Julie's not here today, so I can talk. <laughs> she doesn't like to be behind the wheel when I'm in the car because I get, you know, nervous. <laughs> There's that imaginary break down there. There's a, why, why didn't you, I'm a terrible, terrible backseat driver. I, I am. But we have to just rest sometimes and put ourselves in the hands of somebody else. Anytime you go to surgery and they're saying, count backwards from, <laughs> you're going, I'm trusting you. I'm trusting you that I'll wake up again. But we trust people because we think that they have accomplish some things, that they are trustworthy, that they have learned some things, that, that it is safe to trust these people. Sometimes we have a problem with God. Sometimes we have a problem trusting God to do everything that he said he will do. And it's fascinating, the passage that Jake read for us this morning from Psalm 81, God is marveling at these people. Parents, I'm sure you've said these same words to your children. 
if you would only listen to me, <laughs> if you would only do what I say, it will all work out well for you. And that's exactly what God was telling his people. If you would just listen to me, if you would just pay attention, if you would just do the things I ask you to do, things will work out better for you. Life will be good. Life will be rich. You can open your mouths and I will fill them. I will bring honey from the rocks to feed you. If you would just do what I say, just trust me. Put your faith in me. But most of the time, we struggle with our circumstances. We look around, we see that things are going on around us and we trust in those more than what we've heard from the Lord. And we have a hard time. I want to share a story with you. It's not a story, it's an account. There's a difference there. A story might be a fictional story. This is not fiction. This is an account we find in Genesis chapter 15. This is an account where God and Abraham have a conversation. God tells Abraham some things that are unbelievable. But Abraham believes God. And God does something amazing because of that. In Romans, uh, not Romans, Genesis chapter 15. The writer says this. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no children. So a servant in my household will be my heir. You see, God had made a promise already to Abram. He had said, you're going to be made a great nation. And up to this point, Abram had followed God and God had blessed him and already he had become a powerful entity in the land. So powerful that the nations around him were afraid of him. He didn't even have a home. He was a vagabond traveling in tents around the countryside of a land that he didn't own. And yet, his success, his power was becoming well known. But where was it all going to go? How was it going to survive? Because up to this point, he had no heir, nobody to leave his estate to, nobody to continue in that lineage, nobody to carry on the promise that God had given to him. And at this point, Abram is nearly 100 years old. So is his wife, Sarah. And you know the circumstances. We know so much more about the human reproductive system today, but they weren't dumb either. They knew that at 100 years old, it doesn't happen anymore. It doesn't matter how many oysters you eat. It doesn't matter how well it's health food or a, an exercise routine. It, there are certain physiological things that stop happening at a certain age and childbearing is one and so you look around at the circumstances and Abram's going God what's going to happen well here's where the story goes on verse 4 Genesis 15 said then the word of the Lord came to him to Abram this man this man of Eliezer from Damascus he will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. So God took Abram outside and said, look at the sky. Count the stars. He said, if indeed you can count them. And then he said to him, that's what your offspring is going to be like, like the stars in the sky. And then here is the, the climax of the whole gospel story. Verse 6, Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. Abraham was reckoned righteous when he put his faith in God. Let's pray. 
Father, increase our faith. Help us to know for certain those things that don't even seem right to us. But things that you have promised to us. Father, help us to claim by faith the good news that you've given to us. And Father, I pray that as we claim that, that it would shape and mold our lives so that we will live in the joy of your presence and your name will be honored. God, bless us with faith in your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Abraham looked around and he saw the circumstances. We're both old. No babies in our future. <laughs> and maybe that's a blessing. I don't know. There's, there's a reason that young people have babies. It's hard work. But there was a baby coming. We know the story. We know how it goes on. They tried to help God out, and Ishmael was born. But that was not what God said. God said, between you and Sarah. And so Isaac was born a child of promise. And through Isaac came Jacob, and then the whole Jewish nation grew, which blessed the whole world, which gives us the purpose to be here today. God's promises were sure. And we look back and we see what God did, and we see there was no earthly way that should have happened. And yet God made it come true, because God is faithful to his promises. But what was amazing is that those circumstances did not stop Abram from believing in God. And what the writer says is that when he put his faith in God, God credited that faith to him as what? Righteousness. Was it the things that Abram did that made him righteous? Or was it his faith that made him righteous? And you, we, we, we want to say, well, it was both, right? It was, it was both the things that he did and it was his faith because the faith made him do the things he did. But if he didn't do the things he did, then how would he be saved? And it couldn't be just faith. It had to be his faith and his works, right? That's what we believe and I was taught that for so long. But that is not what scripture says. It said his faith was credited to him as righteousness. Because he believed what God said. I want you to imagine this for a moment. After Abraham, his people were put into slavery for 400 years. We just finished this whole series looking at Joshua, how God brought them out and put them into a promised land. God did something for them they didn't deserve. But on the way out of Egypt, they stopped by Mount Sinai. And at Mount Sinai, God spoke to these people and he said, let me tell you who I am. Let me tell you who you are. I am God in heaven. I am the one who delivered you from Egypt. I am the one who brought you out and blessed you with all the provisions of Egypt. I am the God who will give you life and I am the God who will take you out if you disobey me. Now listen to me. These are my commands. And he spoke to the people and he gave them the commands. And when <laughs> Moses was angry and threw them down, God wrote these again. He wrote them in stone. He wrote them by the power of his voice. He wrote these laws with his own finger. And for 1,500 years later, he had punished the people when they didn't follow the laws. He blessed them when they did follow the laws. He said, you will follow my laws. And then the psalm that we read this morning, the people failed to follow the laws. And so he reminded them, don't you remember, don't have any other gods before you. Don't you remember the things you're supposed to do? I gave you my law. And then comes along this guy named Jesus, who says, 
<clears throat> you know that law? You know that covenant that God made with you? Well, I'm, I'm going to change that. I'm going to give you something new. I'm going to give you something different. I want you to try to put yourself in the shoes of those Israelites, those Jews who were living in that day of Jesus. How hard was that? How hard was that to accept something new, something different? Because all the history of your people, God had punished you if you didn't follow the law he gave. And now comes this guy. He's doing some pretty crazy things, I tell you. But he's telling us that we're not saved by the law anymore. And Paul follows after him and he tries to tell the people, we are not bound under the law anymore. That is not our judge. Our judge is our faith in Christ. That guy who was born in Bethlehem through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. He says, not just to the Jews, but to the Gentiles as well. It's made available to all of us by faith. And in the next chapter, chapter 4, he goes on to explain just what Abraham did. He said, was Abraham justified righteous before he was circumcised or after? Well, it was before. And the Jews put all their, their trust in the fact that they were circumcised, which set them apart as God's people. Recipients of the covenant that God had made with them, that if they do everything right, they'll be saved. Of course, they knew none of them did anything right. He said, it's not based on your work. It's based on your faith, just like Abraham's righteousness was. It was the fact that Abraham trusted God enough and he believed in God. And God said, because of your faith, Abram, I see you as righteous pure and blameless in my sight. Well, that's when the readers of Romans said, step back and said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay. Abram was a special situation, right? God can do it with Abram, but we, we're different. God deals with us different. And I've got to tell you, sometimes religion has not helped us here. Sometimes religion has been guilty of assigning to us the responsibility of doing everything right. To where you've got to go to the right church. You've got to go to the right, right church because every church is different. You've got to make sure you get to the right one. Where's the right name? You've got to do things just one way or else you will be wrong. And if you're wrong, how can you be saved? Anybody here never, ever been wrong? <clears throat> there was a preacher once who asked his congregation, he said, if you think you're perfect, never anything wrong, stand up. Well, there was one man who did stand up. The preacher looked at him and said, so you think you're perfect? The guy said, no, 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 no. I'm speaking on behalf of my wife's first husband. <sighs> Think about that one. None of us are perfect, are we? No matter how hard we work, we've missed the boat of perfection a long time ago. Once you make a mistake, once you, make, once you sin, you are guilty of the whole law, he said. You cannot recover from the first sin. It's downhill from there. Even though you do everything right the rest of your life, you are still lost. But he said, do this. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. And just like Abraham, your faith is credited to you as righteousness. You see, that's good news. That where I put my faith, where I put my trust, makes the difference for all of eternity. I am set free because God has done something for me that I could never do for myself. I am, I am preaching to the choir here. I understand this. And yet sometimes even the choir misses this point. 
And we fail to live in the joy of what God has done for us. We live sometimes thinking, I'm not good enough. I just don't do enough. I haven't met the right quotas. I haven't done the right the criteria. I, I'm not as good as they are, or, or maybe I am. I'm better than they are. And we, we start comparing ourselves to each other. And God says, stop. Just stop and listen to me. I have done something for you. I've loved you so much. You see, the bad news is that I heard growing up so much is that you've got to be good enough. Yes, God saves you. You're baptized into him. You're forgiven. You, are, you receive the Spirit. But, but watch your step. Because... If, if you don't do just the right things, you're not saved anymore. If you don't do just the right things, God's not going to be happy with you anymore. If you don't... But what does the Bible say? None of you are righteous. Not one of you. Put your faith in God, and by that faith, you are reckoned as righteous. Having to be good enough is bad news. You give your life to Christ, you surrender your life to God, and then I had a woman, she called me, she, we baptized her, and I, I promise, she called me three, four times a day. She said, Doug, someone cut me off and I thought bad about him. Can you pray for me? Well, Michelle, yes, I can, but uh, don't worry. <laughs> your faith is in Christ, right? Yeah, 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 but... But I thought something really bad, and I'm afraid if something happened, I'd go to hell. Ring, ring, ring. Doug, pray for me. I, my neighbor did this, and I, and I yelled at him. Ask God to forgive me. Okay. Ring, 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 ring. Doug, I just, I didn't listen to my daughter. She was trying to get something, and I ignored her, and I know that's, that's not a good thing. Can you pray for me? That I think I'm, she's afraid she's going to hell. He said, Michelle. Your faith is in Christ, and when your faith is in Christ, you are pure and blameless in the sight of God. We will fail and we will fall. But God says, it is your faith that is reckoned as righteousness. Now understand this, faith prompts us to do things. But it's not the things we do that make us righteous. It is the God that we put our faith in that makes us righteous. There is nothing that we can do that makes us good enough for God to take us into his heaven. But the fact that he is good. You see, Abraham, it was not Abraham's faith. It wasn't even his faith that reckoned him as righteous. It was the God he put his faith in that reckoned him as righteous. It was the God who had the power to make him righteous. It was the God who had the power to forgive. And it was that faith, before he did anything, that God said, I consider you righteous. The good news is that salvation doesn't depend on trusting, it doesn't depend on my works. It depends on trusting God for his works and what he does. I've heard this statement, and I've, I've, I've shared this with you several times in different groups, but I continue to hear this statement spoken. I know God can forgive sins. I know God can forgive me, and I know that God has forgiven me. I just can't forgive myself. I know what I've done. I know who I've hurt. I know the things that I've failed in, and, I, and I, have, I can't get over that. I can't get over, I can't forgive myself. And you know what that is? That is a lack of faith in God. God never said it was our responsibility to forgive ourselves. And when we take that responsibility on, I want to share with you, 
you are in danger of walking by sight and not by faith. He says, trust me in this. Put your faith in me and I reckon you as righteous. I give you the gift of eternal life. I, 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 God says, give this to you who don't deserve it. To you who there's poison under your tongues, there is deceit in your heart, there is darkness in your life. And I give you light and life and hope. It is God who does it for us when we put our trust in him. So faith does not say, I can't forgive myself. What faith says is I know I don't deserve God's forgiveness, but I believe the promise. I accept by faith what God says. And so I stand before him and I just say, thank you, thank you, thank you for your gift of grace. Because I know I don't deserve it, but I know that I stand pure and blameless in your sight. I don't feel pure and blameless, but I'm not going to rely on my circumstances. I'm going to live by faith and put my trust in you. And even though I have fallen, even though I've made mistakes, I will walk as a child of the king because he has forgiven my sin. You see, last week we talked about suffering. And does suffering count for anything? Absolutely. Every one of us go through suffering. And God uses it. It's been said that God never wastes a hurt. God uses everything that we go through to make us better, to make us stronger. It doesn't mean it's pleasant to go through. But he uses every situation. Suffering counts. What about salvation? Does salvation count? Does it change our lives? Does the fact that God has given us such a great gift through faith, does it count for anything? And can I depend on it? You see, this salvation that we have was not built by the lowest bidder. It was built by the God of all the universe who created everything with the sound of his voice, who we can trust explicitly. And he says, I make you this promise. Put your trust in me. And then walk in the joy. Walk in the joy of that salvation. There is a prayer I'd like to end with in Jude. Verse 24. As Jude prays over these people, that he's been writing to. And he says this, now all glory to God who is able to keep you from falling away and still bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fault. I don't know. I want to say amen to that. Let me read it again and give you a chance. Listen to what he says. He prays to God. Now all glory to God who is able to keep you from falling away and will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fault. Amen? We put our trust in God, not in ourselves. And when we see somebody else who's having problems, who's sinning, we don't point our finger and say, see what they're doing, see what they're doing, see what they're doing, see what they're doing. And we don't point our fingers back to us and say, oh, I'm not good enough, I'm not good enough. We know that already. Not one of us is good enough. What we need to do is say, thanks be to God. Because we have great, great news. And so we're going to end with a song. This song says, thank you, Lord, for all that you've done, I will thank you. And for all that you're going to do, I will thank you. You are the one who has given. You are the one who's providing. You are the one who's walking through us. It's not by my will. It's not by my strength. It's not by my goodness. Because none of us are good enough. But because we put our faith in him, he cleanses us from all righteousness. 
And we're going to say thank you. And as we say thank you to him, we realize this. When somebody has loved you so much, and they've gifted you with things you don't deserve, what do you say about that person? Good things or bad? You say good things about them. You defend them to other people. You tell the story of who they are. You tell the story of what they've done. You say, you hear bad things about them. You go, that's not consistent with what I know about. This is a person who does good things. This is a person who my life was dead and they brought me back to life. And we say these things about God and we do these things about the one who has loved us so much, who has counted us righteous because of our faith. He is the one we serve because he has brought us from death to life because he did the work for us he died on the cross for us we should be dead and separated from God but he paid the price for us he says you want to live by faith then learn about me and follow me. Do what I do. Say what I say. Teach what I teach. Act like I act. Be like me to the rest of the world. Your first act of faith is to put me on in baptism. Where Paul says again that when we're baptized into Christ, we are clothed with him. We are covered with him and God looks at us and says, that's my child, pure and blameless and righteous in my sight. And so we're going to offer this gift of baptism. We have a baptistry right here. It's full of water. The picture that Paul gives us in Romans 6 is that when we are baptized into Christ, we are buried, we die. The old sinful person that is antagonistic towards God dies and is left in the grave and we are born again when we rise from that grave. Peter said when this happens, this is your expression of faith that forgives your sin, that enters you into a life with Christ. You don't do it because it's a good thing for you to do, you do it because you put your faith in God. You say, I believe you, God. I will trust you to do what you say you do. I will believe you that when you say that I'm baptized into you, that you make me your child. You make me an heir of yours. You make me pure. And so by faith, I put my trust in you. And I follow you. And so as we sing this thanksgiving to God, if you've never put Christ on as your Lord, we invite you to do that today. If there's things you struggle with that are extending between you and the joy of walking in the Lord, we want you to talk to our elders in the back. Sit down and pray with them. Find out who this God is and the promises he's had for you that he has for you today. So if we can serve you in that way, do that. Come down here while we stand and sing this song.